thank you for inviting me. And um, I'm honored to be here. I am, I'm very impressed with the, um, the webinar program that you have established. It's quite impressive. And um, I hope that I can offer something interesting today. Um, one thing I do want to say is I'm actually, I actually don't have a doctorate. I'm not a professor. I'm in a sort of an interesting position. I work for the university but I came into this work through um, being an elementary school teacher and doing workshops with young people. Um, and I will kind of tell a little bit about my story today because um, my story about the pleasures of teaching Shakespeare, um, that's the story of how I became a teacher um, is involved in uh, why I think Shakespeare is something pleasurable to learn. Um, but first, can I ask a, a question? Just to anybody who might be able to answer. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm just curious, um, do, do students at the college take a course in Shakespeare? Is Shakespeare part of the curriculum? Or what is Shakespeare's status in the, the college system? Uh, a few extracts are there, sir. A few extracts, okay. Yes, sir. Great, well, so, in the United States, um, Shakespeare has been part of the secondary curriculum for high school students for probably a century at least. So um, when I first encountered Shakespeare, it was as a high school student. So I guess about age 15 when we read Romeo and Juliet. Um, but to be honest with you, I did not enjoy Shakespeare um, when I was a student. And I'm gonna try to share my screen now and kind of show you some pictures to tell my story here. Let's see, okay. All right, the, can you see the screen all right? Yes, sir, we can see, sir. Oh, wonderful, okay. So I'm gonna try to start my slideshow here. Let's see. Okay, so just to begin my, my uh, guide through my experience with Shakespeare, um, this is kind of how I first encountered Shakespeare was as a famous author, something you study in school and in literature, English literature course. Um, perhaps you have worksheets. And for me, it just did not connect as a student. I did not find it very interesting. It seemed like something very old and far away. And it sort of seemed like Shakespeare was something that was under glass in a museum. It wasn't really something that I connected with. Um, and to me, it was kind of like butterflies in a exhibit that had a pin stuck through them and they were, they were quite beautiful, um, but they weren't moving. They, they were sort of frozen in time and something to be <clears throat> admired and then kind of walked away from. Um, and Shakespeare, of course, culturally was always present in these sort of statues and busts and even in the Right side, you see a, an image from a TV show called Batman, which was popular when I was a kid. And uh, Bruce Wayne had a statue of Shakespeare that he would tilt back to open the bat cave. So <clears throat> Shakespeare was just sort of everywhere in the culture. But again, he seems very remote and very distant. Um, and then as a student, I learned about a program at the University of Texas where I was uh, then studying journalism. So I actually began as a writer, not as, a, as an English teacher. Um, and the program took place in a property owned by the University of Texas in a little town called Winedale in rural Texas. And on the property, there was an old barn. This is an old hay barn built in the 1880s. And it turned out to be a perfect space for exploring Shakespeare. And this professor, Dr. James Ayers, first took his students there in 1970. And as you can see, I'm gonna go back to this image. Um, the floor of the barn was just clay and the students are kind of looking around the space and taking it in. And Dr. Ayers began taking his students out there. And what they found was that once they built a stage and kind of transformed the space, it was almost like an Elizabethan Shakespeare theater. And you can see how close the audience is to the performers and the stage comes into the audience as it did in Shakespeare's Globe Theater. 
And this is actually a performance I was in um, in 1990. That's me holding the ax. This is the opening scene from the Comedy of Errors. And as you can see, the barn is open-sided. It does have a roof, unlike the Globe Theater, but light streams in from the sides and you can hear birds and occasionally even see deer and other animals outside. So just to connect this with Shakespeare's theater, you can see how there's kind of a visual connection in terms of the architecture, the wooden beams, and the feeling of an older wooden structure and the audience being close to the performers. So at Windell, <coughs> excuse me, um, we were out in the country. So it, it sort of connected with Shakespeare's um, childhood growing up in Stratford on Avon, small market town in England, um, and also with the Globe in London. This is on the right, a photo from one of the early student productions in 1970 or 19, what was that, 1981, I think. Uh, on the left, you have a student who's working on her lines um, just outside the barn. You can see how rural it is. And um, this was the 1970s. And so there was kind of a free spirit um, from the 1960s on in the United States in the university. So you can see students were starting to grow long hair and, um, so there was an interesting collision between the kind of student energy coming out into this country place and, and meeting the local farmers and cowboys and getting to know them. And that's why our logo is, we call him Cowboy Willie for, cow, for William Shakespeare. And you can see he has a cowboy hat and a piece of straw and uh, some chewing tobacco in his cheek and a bandana. Um, so he's kind of Shakespeare transplanted into rural Texas. These are some scenes from some of the early student sessions out at Windale. And the emphasis was on studying Shakespeare by performing the plays. So the idea was that since Shakespeare wrote texts for actors, not novels or short stories, um, that we're missing something if we don't approach these plays um, by using the stage in some way and trying to experiment and explore different interpretations. So my summer um, out there as a student, and this is a summer course, you actually move out to Windale and live in a dormitory for two months. And this is open to any university student. If any of you want to try to um, come be a student at Windale, we would love to have you. Um, so in your in residence out at Windale, these were the three plays that I studied my summer, and this was 1983 that I was a student there. And we're given a part in each play, and we learn our lines, and then we come out to Windale and we begin working together without costumes, just in our regular, you know, civilian clothes and kind of exploring the characters. This is outside of the theater barn. And whoops, sorry, back up a little bit. And there, no, stop moving there. Okay. There are woods outside of Windale and we, this is a group of us working on a scene from The Tempest, which of course is set on a magical island. So basically we were sort of like young kids um, running off in the woods, pretending, playing make-believe. We had our swords and um, in the scene, these characters have been shipwrecked on this island. And um, that's me on the right, pretending to fall asleep. Um, the reason I couldn't lie down and really fall asleep was because fire ants had just come to Texas. And so when we... <laughs> We had to uh, make sure we didn't get bit. But as you can see, it's, it, was, it, it connects with the play of childhood, with the play of, of Shakespeare. And of course, Shakespeare talked about players instead of actors. And this is our professor, Dr. Ayers, uh, filling in one night for one of the students who was ill. Um, and he loved to play as well. And so he inspired us with his example, playing this role of Stefano in The Tempest with the creature Caliban. These are um, four creatures from the Tempest. And part of the fun of the program was just being inventive. So we made our own masks. And then these masks were used as part of the uh, characters of these dogs that were called on by Prospero to chase um, Stefano, Trinculo, and Caliban. 
Um, Hamlet was an incredible experience to work on learning that play through performing it. And I played the role of the grave digger. That's me on the right um, many years ago. <laughs> um, and these are scenes from The Tempest. Stefano, the character in the center. Um, and then, let's see if I can stop the slideshow for a sec. Um, at this point, um, I left my career in journalism after a, a number of years um, out of university. Uh, this interest in Shakespeare continued and I began teaching workshops for younger students um, because I believed that if I'd had an experience with Shakespeare as a younger student, I might not have found it so uninteresting in high school and I wouldn't have had to wait until university to find it as something inspiring and engaging. So I actually met a teacher who taught fourth and fifth grade, which is ages nine, eight, nine, 10, 11, roughly. And uh, I began doing Shakespeare performances in schools as a helping teacher. And this is a, a school in Washington state. And this was the first group I worked with. And we did, uh, we worked on a Midsummer Night's Dream and that's the students painting the set there. Um, and one of my favorite players on the right, Narith, um, who was quite a character, and um, I was able to reconnect with him about 20 years later after this picture. Um, this is what one of the students wrote 20 years later. Um, whoops, sorry. I'm not used to, I don't use <laughs> PowerPoint very often. Um, one of the students from this class wrote me, and he said, 20 years later, when he was 30 years old, so he'd been doing this as a 10-year-old, he said, what seems most striking to me now so I can't ever remember thinking that doing Shakespeare consisted of work. It felt like play all the way. I can remember sitting up in my room late at night, going over my lines, learning the Henry V speech, delivering it in front of my mirror. Technically, I was doing what kids dread so much, the terrible H word, homework. But it felt no different to me than working on a difficult Nintendo game. Now, this shows how old he is. Nintendo was a big deal back then. Only way better. I was at 10 years old, fully invested in my learning. And I was quite delighted to receive that email from him out of the blue, um, because that would have been my hope at the time that the students would work very hard, learn their lines, work together as a team, but also play together and bring the play to life. And that's really what happened with that group. So that was in 1993, so about 10 years after I was a student at Winedale. And so that led to Professor Ayers um, eventually starting, whoops, sorry, an outreach program at Winedale. So this is a group of my students um, from a fifth grade class in rural Texas uh, performing a scene from The Taming of the Shrew, um, the induction of The Taming of the Shrew. And so what I began doing is working with teachers in classrooms and their students, and then the teachers and students would come to Windale and perform on the same stage that I had performed on. So it was a special field trip for them, and we had a festival where the students would perform. And here are some of the students over the years. Did all kinds of scenes from Romeo and Juliet. That's Juliet talking to her Romeo there over on the right. Uh, that's a sword fight from Romeo and Juliet above. And then um, the ladies below, I believe, are doing the scene from Much Ado About Nothing. And then the student on the left, whoops, was uh, Caliban. And this is me just kind of working with different students to show that it's what's the pleasures of teaching Shakespeare is that it's you're on your feet. It's very fun. It's very active. On the right, I'm teaching a group of students to sword fight. We were doing a massive Romeo and Juliet sword battle between the Montagues and the Capulets. Um, Similar scene up on the left, because um, we're often finding playful ways to perform conflict, um, because obviously a lot of the plays have conflicts early on that are resolved. Uh, on the bottom left, you see a group of students on a day trip from a, a school to Windale, and they're going to come up on that stage in a little bit and, and perform scenes. So we've had thousands of students come over the last 20 years. The program will be 20 years old next year. And so that's why I'm not actually a, a, a doctor. I'm not Dr. Stromberger because I've most, most of my teaching is with younger students. This is our a copy of the program I printed up with the back and front cover. 
Uh, we call it the festival of play. And here is the students all celebrating and singing after one of their performances, just packing the barn. So students from all over, you know, four or five different schools around Central Texas. Um, and it looks like they're having fun. <laughs> I think they did have fun. So part of the hope is that unlike the way I experienced Shakespeare in high school, these students will think of Shakespeare as something that's active, fun. It's something you do with your friends. It's something you do as part of a group. It involves creativity. It involves imagination. Um, and the hope is that that will sustain them as they continue in their education. Now, we also hosted performances of the same student groups on the UT campus, and we call it the UT Children's Shakespeare Festival. So the students were able to perform in a real theater with lighting and a big space. And as you can see, we're not using any sets like Shakespeare's theater didn't have big sets. We're just focused on the language and the characters. We don't worry about the Elizabethan costumes. Some students will wear costumes, some will just wear modern dress. The student on the left is playing Mark Antony in Julius Caesar, the famous Friends Romans Countryman speech. Um, the students on the bottom right are doing the opening of Romeo and Juliet, where they're saying two households, both alike in dignity, and that's why they have the number two up. And the student on the upper right is Romeo, who thinks Juliet is dead. Heartbreaking scene. Um, these are students after performance applauding for other members of their group. And here's a scene from A Midsummer Night's Dream with uh, Lysander and Hermia, I believe. So some, some of the, the costumes were quite wonderful, when the, but it was completely up to the students and the teachers if they wanted to wear one. Um, oh, sorry, flying by again. Now, what I find interesting is the students, when they tell me at the end of the year, I ask them, well, what did you enjoy about working on Shakespeare? And then I have them write something and I get some very interesting comments. Um, the, and I, just to show you a few of these, the first student was talking about being a mariner in the Tempest. And he said, I got to dress up. I like the hats. So they wore little Krispy Kreme donut hats to be mariners. And he said, yeah, they were just Krispy Kreme hats, but it built character. The next student playing Brutus from Julius Caesar. I was thinking this guy likes to bend the truth and I sometimes do that. It was a new feeling to me. I could feel the emotion in Brutus's words and how he, we changed the crowd's emotion. The next student uh, was writing to me about which character she wanted to play. I think I would make a great Titania and that's the queen fairy, queen of the fairies in Midsummer Night's Dream. Because when I was little, I adored fairies. I think being Titania will bring back that old spark that little kids have and that I have almost lost, <laughs> which I thought was so poignant. She was you know, 10 years old when she wrote that and she felt like she was already losing that spark um, of, of childlike you know, creativity. Um, and then this is from a fifth grader. I really, really liked a, a girl who uh, played Lady Macbeth in several scenes. I really, really liked how strong Lady Macbeth was. I liked how she was kind of the boss of the project. I don't know if that's bad, but I kind of think of her as a role model. She seems like a big feminist and I would love to, to be like her, but I don't want to murder anyone. So in case you think we're, we're um, encouraging people to be like Lady Macbeth. Um, so I was really tickled by that one. Now the, the program continues today. Um, this is uh, Dr. James Lowland, who is the director of Shakespeare at Wyandale. Um, that's him on the bottom left in The Tempest. We were actually there the same summer and that's when we first met. He took over the program in the year 2000 and has been director since then. And that's Dr. Lowland on the right leading a group of students in 2021, the first group to come back um, as the pandem pandemic finally receded. And this is, oh, sorry. This is from just the last summer, just a few, maybe, gosh, end of July, early August. This was the summer class of 2022 performing the final scene from The Winter's Tale for an audience in the barn. Now, Dr. Ayers, who started Shakespeare at Windale, now teaches in Camp Shakespeare, a program that's directed by Robin Grace Soto, who um, 
Doc and Robin worked closely together. And there was actually a documentary film made about Dr. Ayers and Windale, Shakespeare at Windale and Camp Shakespeare. And that's the poster on the left. It's called Take Pains, Be Perfect. And um, it's not yet available for streaming, I believe, but um, hopefully it will be eventually. Um, they're showing it at festivals, film festivals. But as you can see, they took a picture of, they took the image of Dr. Ayers from the, that early picture I showed you and they um, sort of put it on top of the barn as if he's standing there on the barn, the Shakespeare barn. Um, and there's a picture of him on the right. And then a quote that he wrote once that I really thought was perfect. Uh, Shakespeare stretches me. I stretch students. Great exercise. He wrote that down as kind of a teaching philosophy. And I've tried to incorporate that into my work with students too, because I believe it's true for, for me as well. Um, and a few more photos here. This the theme of my talk here is about work and play coming together as one. The first thing that happens when you come out to Windale is because it's an old barn is there's a lot of work. You're, we've got to sweep the barn, open up the sides, you know, kind of get everything set up. And that's one of my favorite things about Windale is it's a space that we all have to help take care of. You know, it's an old wooden barn and there's a clay, used to be a clay floor and now it's a brick floor. But, um, that kind of first experience of the students is working together, um, you know, not taking a test or doing a worksheet. It's actually on your feet with a broom uh, cleaning. And I think that's sort of an important first step to show that we are, we are working and playing sort of in the same space. And then eventually the work and the play come together. And this theme of work and play coming together was famously um, stated quite eloquently, I think, by uh, Peter Brook, who was a famous um, theater director, um, began in England and then moved to Paris. Um, and Peter Brook just passed away this summer um, after a long and wonderful career. Um, this is the ending of a book he wrote in the late 60s that was quite important in the early days of Shakespeare at Wyndale. Um, and I'll just read the, the conclusion here. In everyday life, if is a fiction. In the theater, if is an experiment. In everyday life, if is an evasion. In the theater, if is the truth. When we are persuaded to believe in this truth, then the theater and life are one. This is a high aim. It sounds like hard work. To play needs much work. But when we experience the work as play, then it does not work anymore. A play is play. And it's a very simple, just four word statement, but that's kind of the message of, of our Shakespeare at Wendell program. And let me stop this here. So that's kind of the, a little bit about my, my journey. And I think I, do I have about five more minutes? <laughs> have I used up my time? Yes, sir. Okay, I did want to, sh can I show you a short video? If I can get, I'll share screen again here. I just wanted yes. to show you some of my students um, just so you can see the them performing in the barn, get a sense of uh, their enjoyment of Shakespeare. Let's see. Whoop. Okay. I like mine very much. This is fun. It's, it's, it's fresh to say. These raging rocks and shivering shocks shall break the locks of prison gates. And the Phoebe's car shall shine from far and make and mock flush me. What shall we see meet again? And thunder, lightning, and rain. When the hurly burly's done, when the battle's lost and won, to be here in the set of the sun.
bunch of kids that were really shy into and like they made it, it made them into people who were so shy, sort of better at expressing their feelings, you know. These are the forgeries of, of jealousy. And never since the middle summer spring met me on the hill, down to forest or mead, by painted fountain or by rushing brook, or by the beached margin of the sea, to dance our ringlets to the whistling wind. For with thy brows thou hast disturbed our sport, though for the winds piping to us in vain, as in revenge have sucked up from the sea, contagious fogs which falling in the land have every pelting river made so proud that they have overborne their continents. The audience actually helps you because um, if you just stare at the audience and they make you laugh or something, that's really good. So it brings up your energy instead of nervous energy into Shakespeare energy. And you can use that to make it your performance better. Do you let your thumb at us, sir? I no. <laughs> I don't know. Sure. So yes, that's a little bit about me and our program. And um, I hope that later, there's, if there are any questions, there's a little time to answer any questions anyone might have. But thank you, thank you again for allowing me to share a little bit about our, our program with all of you. I'm, I'm really grateful to everyone for having invited me here and for giving me the opportunity. Um, to share my thoughts with you today. So I will start uh, trying and um, share my screen. So um, the pleasures of a home, women in Indian cinematic adaptations of Shakespeare. So the rather well-worn cliche that William Shakespeare is a worldwide phenomenon is borne out not only by the sheer range of textual and stage adaptation of his plays covering over 100 languages, but also by his persistent presence in world cinema. Even outside of the Western world, Shakespearean cinematic adaptations had an early start. It was in the silent era itself that one of the earliest movies inspired by the Bard appeared in India, and this was Champraj Hado around uh, 1923. From the very outset, therefore, celluloid Shakespeare was a global phenomenon, and the recent term global Shakespeare's is thus more an acknowledgement by film and literature critics of this 
plural cinematic and performance traditions than a sudden manifestation of uh, Shakespeare in world cinema. And I think this is an important distinction that you know uh, Shakespeare has, so to speak, uh, been a global phenomena for a, for a fairly long time. Um, so, one of the most commonly discussed of these global Shakespeare traditions is, of course, Bollywood Shakespeare. The power of Bollywood itself, as Kenneth Rothworth argues, lies in it being part of the vast Indian film industry, which in North Africa, the Middle East, and the Far East has rivaled Hollywood in productivity and influence. Moreover, given the colonial education system in the Indian subcontinent, the tastes of its middle class, the Indian film industry has long engaged with Shakespeare. With the sphere of Bollywood Shakespeare's, however, Vishal Bhartwaj's adaptations stand apart as exceptions, and Bhartwaj is who I want to focus on uh, today primarily. In part, this is owing to the fact that Bhartwaj returns to the Bard space again and again. And uh, he is the only Bollywood director to do so. So Jairaj, for instance, uh, also has his Shakespearean trilogy, but within the genre of Bollywood Shakespeare, uh, Vishal Bhartwaj is an exception. So Bhartwaj started his first Shakespeare adaptation with Magboon. This is Macbeth in 2003, followed up with Omkara Othello in 2006, and Heather Hamlet in 2014. And from what we can understand, he's uh, embarking on his uh, trilogy of comedies now, but this is still in the works. And so while Indian cinema has from its earliest years included Shakespeare adaptations, never before has there been a Bollywood Shakespeare trilogy. So today I'm interested in exploring how the political and the domestic worlds intersect in Bhartwaj's trilogy. Although they are set in different regions, one of the common themes that emerges in Bhartwaj's films is the quest for a home, a quest that is repeatedly threatened by the dystopic political realities of post-independence India. This domestic theme and its disruption become important precisely because Bhartwaj in his trilogy opts for contemporary settings instead of ones in mythical or historical India. Shakespearean tragic heroes are thus recast as ordinary, even at times middle-class characters. Their primary concern therefore is no longer the acquisition or the future of an actual kingdom. All the heather comes closest in articulating a desire for political autonomy. Rather, the central characters, especially the women in Padvaj's films, all want to build their own homes, a domestic space that they can imagine as their own and filled with their loved ones. In each instance, the domestic drama drives the plot forward and the personal needs of the characters, their hopes, fears, and dreams become the most important. Through this domestic framework, Bhartwaj offers a stringent criticism of the political realities of modern India. Its corrupt administrators, a thriving criminal underworld, and the plight of ordinary Indian women caught between the two. As we shall see in the Indian Shakespeare trilogy, the domestic and the political come together to chronicle the fraught and often tragic realities of contemporary India. So part one then, uh, the Bhartwaj trilogy. While Macbeth had traditionally enjoyed a strong presence in the Indian stage, second only to Othello, the play remained largely ignored by Bollywood film industry prior to Macbeth. Much like the early films in influenced by the Parsi tradition, Macbeth contained several song and dance episodes the modest in, in number compared to the standard Hollywood fare. Dialogues in Magdal 
our cry, however, from the exaggerated rhetorical style of the 1940s and 50s. Instead, Bhardwaj's adaptation masterfully reworks Shakespeare's imagery to fit the muted yet hard-hitting depiction of Mumbai's gangland. In its contemporary setting, Magpul thus differs from Shakespeare appropriations. In 1935 productions of Hamlet, Khun Ka Khun, for instance, which used primarily Victorian costumes as backdrops, or even the Throne of Blood, which portrayed the feudal Japan. Instead, Magbul continues a trend that I would argue is started by Angur as early as uh, 1981-82, which is based on the comedy of errors and where Shakespeare's plot is taken out of um, a mythical past or an imagined past and is set into contemporary modern day middle class uh, domestic settings. And uh, Bhardwaj seems to follow that trajectory rather than anything else. So speaking shortly after the release of uh, Mokbul in 2015, Bhardwaj claimed that the film happened by accident. And I'm quoting here, I had no plans to take up Shakespeare. I had not read Macbeth. I didn't know what it was, Bhardwaj says famously. Nonetheless, Bhardwaj returns to Shakespeare twice more, each time to take up a well-known tragedy while avoiding the comedies altogether so far. The three tragedies that Bhardwaj chooses, Macbeth, Othello, and Hamlet, are noted, among other things, for being political plays. If Macbeth examines questions of kinship and tyranny, then Othello and Hamlet both trace how the actions of individuals impact the well-being of the state. At the end of Othello, uh, the general is dead and the state of Venice seems to be more vulnerable to Turkish invasions than ever before. While Hamlet closes with Fortinbra, the uh, Prince of Norway taking over Denmark. Now transposing Shakespeare's plots to modern day India, Bhardwaj negotiates this political dimension, even as he highlights the domestic elements of these tragedies. The domestic in fact becomes political in Bhardwaj's adaptations with the central characters in each instance trying to find or return to an ideal home only to find it torn apart by social and political turmoil. In both Magpul and Omkara, the interlinked worlds of organized crime and political parties trap the eponymous protagonists and the women who love them, Nimi and Dolly. When the women concerned dare to alter their domestic setup, they are each directly or indirectly punished. The final apotheosis of this thwarted quest for a home happens in Heather, where we find Kashmir caught in a political bind between the Indian armed forces and the insurgents. In all three Bhartwaj movies, we find that the films are situated in contested political or legal spaces. Magpul in Mumbai's criminal underworld and Omkara in the ganglands of Uttar Pradesh while Heather gets played out against terrorism in Kashmir. In these spaces, the women of Bhardwaj's adaptations most acutely bring out the tragic desire for a home and their bodies bear the brunt of the failure to achieve this. For instance, Nimmi, much like her counterpart, Lady Macbeth, urges Magbul to murder Abaji, the Duncan character. But the principal motivation for this is personal. Nimi is Abaji's mistress, and she believes that she's about to be replaced by the Bollywood, by a new Bollywood starlet. While the younger and unattached Bagbul, on the other hand, she can imagine with him a more stable home, especially when she can no longer return to her parents' house after the long years in Apache's concubinage 
And so the image on uh, the right here uh, shows the engagement party of Abaji's daughter, Samira, with Guddu, who is the, 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 the Pleans character. And they feed each other. And Abaji's newest heartthrob, the lady wearing uh, the black sari here, proceeds to flirtatiously offer him food and Abaji makes his preference seemingly clear for the newcomer, signaling an eminent switch in mistresses. And Nimi is effectively abandoned and forgotten, and she watches the couple from the sidelines. And so for Nimi, murdering Abaji is not just about mere ambition or revenge. Instead, it translates into survival, a shot at a light with the man that she loves, Mabul. Nimi had resorted to insinuations earlier, but she now explicitly quotes Mabul to murder, wearing the sacrificial garland reserved for slaughtered go goats, right? And it, it, it's a very interesting image here where one can perhaps think that, you know, she is all dressed up, decked up like a beautiful Indian bride, but that there is also that image of her becoming like the symbolic sacrificial goat. And uh, this is the fate that she wants to escape, right? And this is the moment where she gives uh, Mokbul a choice an ultimatum, so to speak, either kill Abaji or kill me, because if Abaji lives, then I'm as good as dead. And the term Abaji, of course, literally translates into father. So this is a very interesting sort of familiar plot that is going on there as well. Whereas where neither Makbul nor Nimi are related to him, are related to Abaji by blood, but they are sort of um, part of this, this uh, criminal dystopic family. And so Nimi persists in her pleas for murder. And she informs Magbo that she has to choose between two deaths, a budgie's or her own. The murder therefore is triggered by ambition as well as love. And Nimi, like many Bo Bollywood heroines needs to be rescued, although in this film she orchestrates her own release. As the plot unfolds, we realize that the unholy criminal alliance among Mumbai politicians, Bollywood, and the underworld, which had prevented her from becoming an actress, now comes in the way of her securing a lasting home. Mimi's madness coincides with the political turmoil in the state and the legislators after being kidnapped and held for ransom by Magbul's new foe, Kuddu, the Fleance character again. Magbul is desperate to resolve the situation and makes matters worse by joining hands with armed smugglers. This crisis also tragically distracts Magbu from fully grasping Nimi's descent into madness. Instead of providing her with the help she needs, he resorts to violence when, for instance, she says that she can hear her unborn child cry each night because they have killed its father. Magbu sort of lashes out and physically uh, abuses her. So the results of this political crisis are catastrophic, not only for Magpul, but also for Nimmi. She pays with her own life when being stripped of all governmental protection, they have to go on the run and she's prematurely removed from the hospital where she was recuperating after a difficult childbirth. So this new phenomena of giving Lady Macbeth a life and a story of her own in Indian cinema has spread to subsequent adaptations. One of these is the Bengali web series called Mondar. And so not unlike many of the other recent Bollywood adaptations, Mondar is set in the criminal underworld. 
Unlike, say, Vishal Parthwaj's Manpur, though, the backdrop is not urban India, but rural. Set in a remote fishing village, the shots zoom from the silty gray waters of the Bay of Bengal to the large fisheries of Haris. But the driving force of this version, again, is not Bondar or the henchman of the local criminal gang lord, Dablu Bhai, but his wife, Laili. And Laili's problem is that Mondar, despite being a powerful man, is important. And she desperately wants family. She desperately wants a child of her own. And it is her desire, again, for a stable home and for a child that sort of drives the plot forward. And it is her fears and her trauma that sort of become the principal reason why, again, the Duncan-like figure is uh, killed and murdered. So it's no longer just a question of abstract ambition or ambition for the husband. Um, the, Indian cinematic Lady Macbeth opt to remove the Duncan figure because they want something out of it for themselves, not just for the man that they are attached to or married to. And this, I think, is an important distinction between Shakespeare's original play text and uh, the more recent Indian adaptations. So similarly, in Omkara Dolly, Desdemona figure, dreams of a blissful married life with Omi, Othello. Here too, Bhardwaj alters the Shakespearean plot in really interesting ways. So whereas in the play, Othello and Desdemona are already married in the beginning, in the movie, the marriage itself becomes a contentious issue when Omi, under the influence of Langratyagi, Yago, begins to doubt Dolly's fidelity. We are shown close-up scenes of Dolly in Omi's ancestral home, trying to make it her own domestic space. She's frequently reminded by Omi of his mother and the other wives who had once worn the traditional kamarban, a waist ornament, and won the hearts of their husbands and extended families. The kamarban, like the black handkerchief in Shakespeare's playtext, is Omi's gift to Dolly and a pledge of his sincere intention to actually marry her. Because remember, for most of the film, they are not, they are not married, they are living together, but they're still not legally man and wife. And so the ornament, much like the handkerchief in Othello, is tied to marital bliss. But the kamarband in the movie is also much more. It is an heirloom that has marked out the wives of this feudal family for generations. And when Dolly loses it, the results are predictably catastrophic. Umkara interrogates her as hapless Dolly turns to her neatly organized room and starts searching for it, but of course is, is unable to find it. And um, Omkara again lashes out, not with physical violence, but with verbal violence, with, with verbal abuse. And sort of taunts her as to how can she be a good wife if she can't even hang on to a, a family heirloom um, for just a couple of days, right? So it is clear from Omi's insinuations that an ideal bride, one who, one who would manage the household and her husband wisely and in accordance with patriarchal expectations would not lose the waistband so easily. In Omkara, as in Magpul, politics plays a key role in shattering domestic bliss. What causes Omi to begin doubting Dolly is, of course, Langa Tyagi's machinations after he gets passed over for the position of Bahubali, or chief henchman, during the necessary reshuffles in the lead up to the state elections. 
what should have been a liberating democratic process therefore destroys Dolly's hopes for a home, even as the criminal violence with which Omi's gang supports their political party destroys the hopes for a democracy that follows the rule of law. Omkara also pulls at other socio-political tensions that drip into the Indian subcontinent, notably caste divisions. As Othello is the Moor, Omi is the darker skinned man born to a Brahmin father and a lower caste mother. He's constantly reminded of his quote unquote half caste status and he's constantly taunted as the other Brahmin who has dared to set his sights on a fairer dolly. These caste uh, tensions get further aggravated once the electoral process kicks in and Dolly's domestic desires get disrupted by a series of events leading to her tragic confrontation with Omi on their wedding night. The first two films in Bhadwaj's trilogy then, though set in vastly different geographic and demographic contexts, project a criminalized political nexus where criminals contest and win elections even while they are in prison and a world that then intrudes into and destroys the domestic spaces of its chief characters. Trapped, the women find their private desires pitted against larger political forces that ultimately come together to destroy their domestic hopes. In Magbul, as well as in Omkara, these personal or rather domestic crises drive the plot forward, crises that are aggravated by underlying political factors and felt most acutely by the leading women in these adaptations. As a result, both women die trying to find this ideal domestic place, Nimi at child bar, and Dolly on the night of her ill-fated marriage. And so these are sort of little uh, screen grabs that I have here sort of take us to the full trajectory of a home card of her happiness. And then of course the trouble that gets uh, sown in, in, into the heart of that domestic bliss. So part two then, either, and the apotheosis of the domestic tragedy. Bhardbhaj's third Shakespearean adaptation is set in Kashmir and continues the theme of the political intruding into and disrupting the domestic space. It follows the story of Heather Hamlet, the only son of Hilal Ni, Hamlet Sr., and Ghazala, Gertrude. Purram, the Claudius figure, is a lawyer who profits from the political disturbance in the state and makes use of the knowledge that his brother Hilal had been helping insurgents in his capacity at, as a doctor and gets him arrested during a raid by the armed forces. Heather returns to Kashmir, disrupting his studies at Aligarh University and desperately tries to trace his father's whereabouts. Haider is aided in his quest by Arshia, the Ophelia figure, who is a journalist. Yet it is Haider's relationship with his mother and not Arshia that drives the movie forward and gives it much of its emotional urgency. The film goes much farther than the Shakespearean play text with adolescent scenes of Haider applying perfume to Ghazala and anecdotes that are told by other characters about how, as a child, he wanted to marry his mother. And of course, you know, there's a the classical Oedipal subtext to this as well, uh, made famous by Freud's own reading of the play. So Haider, unsurprisingly, follows the pattern set by Bhardwaj's previous films with Ghazala, the Gertrude figure, coming across as a much stronger character than her Shakespearean counterpart in, voice, in voicing her sexual desires and her hopes for a stable home with her son and her new husband, Puram. Critiquing the portrayal of Ghazala, historian Mridu Rai, for instance, argues that Ghazala, Haider's mother, and I'm quoting Rai here, 
is one of the most vacant characters this film could have produced. She keeps proclaiming herself as a half widow while she has the privilege of becoming, except for a minor religious legal hurdle, soon overcome a full-fledged wife. The only person she cares for is her son. I end quote here. But part of the problem that Rai outlines here arises from the fact that, as with Bhardwaj's other adaptations of Shakespeare, the main action of Hyder is primarily in the domestic space, despite its political setting, right? despite being set in Kashmir. Furthermore, as the plot unfolds, the Kashmiri setting arguably becomes more and more incidental. It actually could have been set in any sort of troubled political space, and the story would still have worked, the plot would still have worked, the characters would still have translated. And the murder of uh, Dr. Hilal, Haider's father, results from his brother's jealousy, not from any larger political agenda. Heather, however, fits in well with Bhardwaj's Shakespearean trilogy in the way that the domestic plot reveals and reflects the significance of the larger political world that disrupts and destroys it. While Bhardwaj's depiction of political problems in the Indian state remain incomplete, the characters, particularly Ghazala, follow the usual arc. Her dreams of being able to find a stable home are much like those of Mimi and Dolly, dashed at the end. Ghazala, unlike them, however, Ghazala gets to save her loved one. And Bhardwaj's Hamlet, Strange Jera, gets to live. Ghazala becomes the Avenger. As a suicide bomber, she kills Kurram for his offenses against both Hilal Meer and her son, Heather. The climactic moment in the film is thus Ghazala's death, not Hamlet's, right? Not Heather's. So similarly in Magpul, Mimi's death, unlike Lady Macbeth's, which receives only a past, passing mention in the play text, gets shown on screen. The camera lingers as Magpul clings to Mimi's corpse and carefully covers her with a scarf. When the police arrive, they pause and take note of Mimi's death. In Omkara again, the camera repeatedly returns to Dolly's corpse in order to dramatize the full effects of the tragedy. She lies on a swing fully dressed in her bridal finery while Omi sits next to her motionless. They are discovered by a distraught Indu, Emilia, and later by Langra Tyagi and Kesu Firangi, the Cassia figure. In Heather, there is no corpse to mourn over but Ghazala's disintegrated body, as surely as the visible ones of Mimi and Dolly, marks the impossibility of securing stable futures for the women who inhabit India's marginal spaces. In tracing the dilemmas of these women, Bhardwaj turns to Shakespeare's plot uh, and turns the original story into Indian narratives of private loss and of political failure. Bhardwaj's trilogy ultimately has a sense of continuity, not only because the films share their common themes, such as violence in the political and domestic spheres, but also because the director casts some of India's best known actors in the films. For instance, the critically acclaimed actor Nasiruddin Shah, who plays Purohit in Madhpur, also appears as the crime lord Bhaisa, the Duke of Venice, in Omkara. Similarly, Irfan Khan is both Madhpur and Ruhdar. And Ruhdar, of course, is Bhardwaj's twist on uh, the ghost of Hamid's father. Most prominently, however, Dabu plays the roles of both Nimi and Ghazala, and you can see here, you know, uh, Dabu as Nimi and Ghazala as, and, and Dabu as Ghazala again in the uh, 
climactic scenes of the, of the movies. Such a repetition, especially in the case of the characters uh, based on Lady Macbeth and Gertrude, help us better recognize the domestic tragedies that get played out in these adaptations, the shattered dreams of these women and the socio-politically marginalized spaces of India. In chronicling these lives, Bhardwaj's films stand out as highly acclaimed global adaptations that they have become. Thank you. A wonderful uh, uh, webinar which has happened, which was an uh, international webinar from the Sheshadripuram Evening Degree College. I would like to say that uh, theme speaker Dr. Clayton and Dr. Amrita has uh, given their uh, uh, topics a wonderful discussion and also they have enlightened in many of the aspects which they were actually very strong. And I would like to say that Dr. Clayton has uh, worked on many characteristics of uh, Shakespeare and uh, he has uh, given a, a wonderful, uh, uh, the means I have to stay, he has given from his own uh, appreciation of uh, Shakespeare from uh, when he started his work as a writer and, uh, help, as a, and started a helping teacher in the performance of Shakespeare. He has uh, brought about the characters in, uh, from the ages from his job and how the work has to be considered and how the job has to be taken, correlating with both the aspects, how the teamwork has to be performed and how actual place of Hamlet or Midsummer Nights, how he has characteristic and how he has trained the students in different levels. That is, it is a very difficult thing for bringing up school children to perform in such a wonderful way. He has brought the work of as a team and a pleasure of teaching Shakespeare, he has experienced, he has brought that out and uh, I'm very thankful for him. And uh, his uh, compliment place also is wonderful. That is how for uh, different schools and uh, in Texas, how he has uh, brought about the life journey, his own life journey he has given it in a beautiful uh, presentation, PowerPoint presentation and how he has enjoyed the work along with the job, what he has done and the fun which he has uh, and the creativity which he has brought about is a wonderful thing that uh, adapting such things is a wonderful and uh, I have to say that along with students and also at the same time, I could just see uh, the wonderfulness of uh, different uh, arena of uh, people that is, uh, for example, the students from different communities or uh, different world has actually come across him. I have to, I actually just saw one of the students in his marking, Mr. Radha Krishnan, fifth grade student performing the Hamlet. Uh, I could just find out. And many of the African cultures and many division from the different world was the, his student. So it is a wonderful thing that uh, they had all the opportunity to come under him and take this wonderful thing and enjoy the participation in the stage especially, because stage performances are different and the class performance is completely different. I have to say that he has given a wonderful training for those students and those students and naturally he has also read some of the students who have given their appreciation to him. He, yes, from his face only we could just find out he was very happy to read those things. And I'm thankful for his uh, today's participation in our college. At the same time, I, I want to thank Amrita Madam also, the, she has compared our Bollywood movies and especially Vishal, Vishal Bharadwaj, director's uh, movies and Jairaj, he has, she has appreciated their works and she has uh, compared some of the movies like Angur, the uh, comedies or the tragic sessions of Makbul and the tragic actions and political plots, she has explained it and she has compared with uh, Omkara, the two, uh, two, 2006 movie with the Othello, how uh, it, it was brought about. And even though the director is uh, not uh, actually giving much of the importance of characters, but still copying the uh, uh, theme of the things, how she, she has given it in a wonderful way. I would like to thank both of them. And at the same time, I would like to say that with uh, the 
great uh, Shakespeare performances in our scenario of the world in uh, Indian context. We, in our uh, local uh, privileges, we are acting uh, or uh, students are playing with a great place of our Indian context like uh, Ramayana plays or Mahabharata. The Shakuntala dramas are being conducted in the Indian platforms and mythological stories and even the cinema, cinema on our mythologies are also created. If uh, just I want to just bring it to the notice of uh, Dr. Clayton that uh, many of the dramas or the plays which are of international standards are also being conducted from our uh, students or our children in the schools are also being conducted. Especially I would like to say Shakuntala drama or the mythological stories which has been converted into films as Amrita Madam was telling, even uh, from the Mahabharata, Savitri, the film which was uh, way back in 1937 was brought out from uh, Niraj Pal, which was wonderfully created in such old days itself. The dramas was put or the Anguli Mala, the story which from the again from the Mahabharata is taken up and uh, many of the plays have come out into the film forms. And I would like to say that in this part of the world, the whatever the characteristics of uh, Shakespeare, the importance was given. Even similarly, our plays have taken their plots also or the central stages have been given importance. So with this, I just want to conclude that uh, this uh, day, a wonderful day with you joining over to our college uh, uh, invitation. I would like to thank the students of uh, Sheshadripuram Evening Degree College and uh, especially Vandana and Monica who started this program of the webinar. And I would like to thank Darapa Konnur, Abhilash and uh, Vinay Sagar sir, and especially principal to have coordinated all this program. NS Satish sir, thank you one and all for this wonderful evening.